welcome to the Troll B platform. We're 80 kilometers off the west coast of Norway, directly above one of the world's largest oil and gas fields. The whole area covers more than 770 square kilometers, about the size of London, and extends into four North Sea blocks. On the seabed, 300 metres below us, in one of the most inhospitable parts of the North Sea, lies one of the largest and most complex subsea installations in the world. The installation, which consists of a multitude of interconnected templates, supplies oil to this platform and the Troll Sea. The actual oil field lies a further 1,200 metres down on the Horda platform, virtually at the edge of the Viking Graben, an underwater rift valley that started to form some 285 million years ago. The entire field is divided into two major parts a gas field in the east and the oil field here in the west. Although the field was discovered in 1979, it would require a further 16 years of planning and research before production could begin in 1995. The oil field is located within two tilted fault blocks and consists of a variety of sands, from clean sands with excellent production characteristics to silts and muds from which oil cannot be extracted. Initially thought to represent a single prograding shore face, the reservoir would prove to be an interbedded sequence of sandstones, siltstones and mud formed in a much more complex way. In addition, the extremely thin oil column in the reservoir would make this oil field a real challenge. So in order to understand fully the complexity of the task in hand, we must go back in time. This is the Horda platform at the dawning of the Troll Field, 160 million years ago in the Jurassic period. The Viking Graben has been developing for the last 125 million years, dividing the Norwegian coast from the British Isles. Behind me, you will see a flat river delta, the lower part of the Songnefjord formation, which provides vast amounts of sand to the edge of the Horda platform. About 25 kilometers over there, we'll find the Troll gas field. And a further 80 kilometers inland, we'll discover the city of Bergen on the Norwegian coast. But that's in the future. This is the very sand that will one day become the Troll Reservoir, containing oil and gas. This sand is clean and coarse, with very little mud. And as we'll discover later, this is of great importance, because this clean sand, or sea sand, allows the oil to flow through it quite easily, rather like water through a sieve. The finer particles, mud, 
and a shiny flat mineral called mica, however, are washed out by the waves. And further offshore, in calmer waters, these fine material is able to settle. We refer to this material as M-sand, or micaceous sand. Buried in the sand, we also find the remains of shells, wood fragments, and even dinocysts, a form of microscopic plankton. In the future, these will prove very important because the fossils we find will tell us a lot about these times and conditions. The Boreal Sea, open only to the north, will become the North Sea, where the troll field lies. At the start of the Upper Jurassic in the Calovian period, this sea will join with the Tethian Sea to the south. This connection creates an open seaway through which strong marine currents will be funneled, much like the present-day English Channel, only wider. These newly established currents flow southwards along the Norwegian coast, changing the previously symmetrical delta coastline into an asymmetrical one dominated by an elongated spit system. As sand is continuously added to the spit, the beach is growing outwards in increments towards the sea. Each increment, or clinoform, has a characteristic lens shape, thin at the ends and thick in the middle. In the shallow waters, there isn't enough room for the sand to settle, so most of it is swept outwards until it reaches the slope in the seabed. Here the sand accumulates to form a characteristic wedge. As long as the river supplies sand, this process will continue. Raw sheets of sand are formed that will become the main targets for the production wells of the future. At times, the sea level falls, exposing the older layers. When this happens, the river system cuts wide valleys into the older sand sequences. These are later mixed with other types of sand. But as the sea level rises again, the old spit becomes covered by deeper, quieter water and a layer of micaceous fine sand accumulates on top. This thin layer is called a flooding surface. It marks the flooding of a spit sequence and it occurs at a unique point in geological time. A new spit then starts to emerge from the shoreline and the process repeats itself. But environmental influences, such as storms and earthquakes, damage the front of the spit and sea sand sometimes slides down into the normally quiet offshore areas. This is one of several major floodings that drowned the Horda platform. The resulting M sand is a valuable marker that can be traced across the whole of the troll field. This occurred many times throughout the Upper Jurassic to form the alternating clean and micaceous sands of the Somniford Formation. A significant fall in sea level at this time alters the coastline and a broad valley is cut. As sea level rises again, a huge estuary or brackish river system develops behind the spit. Broad tidal flats and large sandbanks form. The sands move with the tides and although of the same age, they are not actually connected to the spit. The microfossils in front of the spit are different from those behind it. In front of the spit, 